Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Um, I am absolutely shocked this morning to see all of you here, bright-eyed and chipper, ready for our uh, program this morning. Anybody be a big winner last night at the, uh, in the casino? You did? Raise a hand. Hey, uh, staff, will you go get a, uh, a PAC contribution from that individual and a scholarship contribution uh, from that individual? Good morning and welcome to our third New Jersey Business and Economic Roundtable. I'm Ralph Albert Thomas, CEO and Executive Director for the New Jersey Society of CPAs. And we have put together an exciting panel this morning of experts to share their insight and import about the important issues facing New Jersey. Before we dive in, I wanted to uh, thank our sponsor for today's program, Columbia Bank. This is the third year that Columbia has been the sponsor for this event. So at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, and introduce Sean Bradley, who is a manager at Columbia Bank. Sean? Oh, oh, there he is. I knew he was here. I met him this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. Good morning, and on behalf of Columbia Bank, I want to thank you for let us, letting us be the sponsor of this year's breakfast and roundtable discussion. For those of you who have been here in the last couple of years, it's usually a guy that looks like Groucho Marx up here, but Gordon Gorab couldn't make it this year, so he, uh, he asked me to cover him and said he'll see you all next year. I'm excited to hear from this panel of experts on the issues facing business and individuals in New Jersey, and I'm sure it's going to be a valuable discussion. I'd also like to congratulate Ed on his appointment as president, Sarah as being president-elect, and Walter as, as doing a fantastic job as the uh, outgoing president. It's a very exciting time at Columbia Bank. We're celebrating our 90th year in business. We're the, th we're the third largest independent bank in the nation and the largest domiciled in New Jersey. We uh, create banking relationships based on experience, financial stability, and quality service. We have 47 full service branches supporting our team of experienced lenders, professionals, and satisfying our clients' banking needs. For those of you that have uh, referred your clients to Columbia, thank you. And for those who, of you who have not had a chance, please be assured that if you do, we'll take good care of them and make you look good. Um, without further ado, I want to welcome the New Jersey Business and Economic Roundtable panel, and thank you again. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for Columbia Bank and their support for uh, this event. And um, so, how's everybody feeling this morning? You, like I say, you look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed because they were throwing down last night. I tell you, over at uh, Premier. Um, so. I want to thank, uh, thank Sean for uh, their continued support. Um, over the past year, the NJCPA has dedicated time and resources to advocacy. Uh, we've achieved uh, several important uh, victories, I would say, uh, over the time. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that we are live streaming this. So I, before I, I go on, I want to welcome those who are participating vis-a-vis -vis the live stream to today's program. On Wednesday, when I opened up the conference, I talked about our theme for this conference, which was steadying the course and all the things that impacted the course, if you will. The global environment, what's happening on, on a national scene down in Washington, or I guess or what's happening and not happening uh, in Washington, and also what's happening here in our state. Um, as I said, we achieved some very significant um, victories during, uh, with the passage of the TTF and tax relief package and the repeal of New Jersey's estate tax or movement towards the repeal. This year it's a $2 million threshold and uh, January 2018 it is going away. Uh, we continue to monitor uh, future legislation in order to make New Jersey a better place to do business and a place that individuals want to stay and retire in. If, if you'd like to get more uh, involved, feel free uh, with the NJCPA. It's still time to make a contribution to the PAC. 
Uh, we need your support uh, in order to make sure that we have a seat at the table. Okay, now let me get on, uh, oh, before I go, I'm getting ahead of myself. Questions will be provided vis-a-vis -vis slido.com and use event code 8847. Uh, if you don't want to do that, we do have cards on all of the tables, right, Don? Or are cards available? No, we don't have cards available? Okay, so we're going to have to lose te use technology. Again, join us at slido.com, hashtag 8847 to submit a comment. And please make it a comment and not a dissertation, all right? And they will be able to see on the, on the panels the, the questions that have been posed. So let me now get uh, to the point of introducing our distinguished panel. The first individual I would like to introduce is uh, a gentleman who uh, many of you know, who's been with us uh, a number of times, and that's Senator Stephen Oroho to my far left. Um, the senator has been a great supporter for uh, the profession. He's a member of the society, and he has been um, uh, a warrior, I guess, to say the least, in the state legislature trying to bring together uh, individuals from both sides of the aisle and in the middle of the aisle and on the outside of the aisle. Uh, and then we, um, we have uh, uh, Michael Simons uh, with us today. He is the State House Bureau Chief for New Jersey 101.5. He previously covered the State House for Gannett newspapers for more than 15 years. He's co-author of the biography, Chris Christie, The Inside Story of His Rise to Power. And last but not least, we have G. Scott, uh, G. Scott Clemens, uh, CFA. He is the Chief Investment Strategist at, at Brown Brothers Harriman and he is one of the firm's primary writers and speakers on topics related to the economy, financial markets, and investing, and he's been a speaker for the society before. So give a warm welcome to our panel this morning. So let me uh, take my seat and uh, start to uh, get things uh, on, on the road here in terms of this. Um, Let's start off with the, uh, a question for Senator Orho or, or comment. Um, you, as I say, were the warrior in helping to put together the TTF and the tax reform package. Uh, we've heard some interesting opinions about phasing out the, uh, phasing out the, the phase out of the estate tax once a new administration comes on to play. Give us your thoughts. What, what have you been hearing amongst your colleagues in, uh, in Trenton? Gentlemen, turn on your mics if you, if you have it. It's now good. Can you hear me? Okay. You liked it better before, right? <laughs> um, well, actually, the, the architects were myself, Senate President Sweeney, Senator Sarlo, yeah. um, and you also you had the, uh, on, on the assembly side, you had bipartisanship as well. Uh, I think one of the things about the estate tax, you heard people, there's always going to be the contingent that want to bring it back. There's an article today in the Wall Street Journal about how many states are looking at it and saying, uh, there's, you know, the states that still have the estate tax and how it's been driving people away. So uh, when we changed, the interesting thing is, uh, one, um, I've heard from people that we got to bring it back, and I said, listen, well, the first thing, we did in the bill itself. The only real lockbox you have in New Jersey is the Constitution. Now, we don't have a constitutional amendment for it. However, part of the original restructuring the bill included a poison pill. And the poison pill was this. If you bring back the estate tax or you uh, get rid of the retirement income exclusion, um, uh, increase from 20000 to 100000 the guess the increase in the uh, the fuels tax goes away as well. Um, so is there ways that they can get around that? Yes, there is. But, there's, but there has to be very visible ways for them to get around. And, and I will tell you, anecdotally, um, I've heard people on both sides of the aisle um, and on the majority side say, you know what? It's working. I, um, one very prominent senator had said to me, um, you've talked about this for 10 years and I 
I never believed it would really work because I've had so many calls into my office where they said they have now changed their plans. And had, uh, one person had said to me that in Naples, Florida, um, they're starting to see a reduction in land values and some of from their real estate consultants because there's less demand coming out of New Jersey. <laughs> so I like that. Um, so you know what, I think with Ralph what's gonna happen is what they're gonna see, now all the CPAs, financial planners, estate attorneys, we're the first ones who are gonna be able to tell them, you know, hey listen, no, you're gonna, actually, we're gonna make money on this because we'll now have the stream of income, people be, will keep their domicile here and we'll have their income tax revenue, their sales tax revenue, you know, coming in. Um, and quite frankly, we will undoubtedly make money, but the, the, the real proof in the, in the uh, New Jersey Treasury will take a little bit longer than what we all see. And, and I think that's really a very important role that we can play to make sure our legislators and our new administration, whatever uh, side of the aisle that may come from, <coughs> understand it's working. Okay. Michael, you've covered this issue, I'm sure, um, you know, on, on radio. What are you hearing from individuals who, who call into your program or that you talk to? So I think that the, uh, I guess the future of the estate tax depends a lot on the result of the election. I, I haven't heard Lieutenant Governor Guadano speak specifically on the estate tax. I guess I haven't covered enough of her campaign events, perhaps. But she generally says she doesn't want to increase taxes. Um, and Phil Murphy, the Democratic candidate, criticized the estate tax um, phase out when it was approved and so presumably would want to reverse that as governor. I don't think that even if it were to be restored, that it would be fully restored at the level that it used to be. Even um, New Jersey policy perspective, which kind of analyzes state policy issues from the liberal perspective, even when they write reports about it, they talk about restoring it at a higher threshold, um, $2 million, $1 million, depending on the analysis. So I don't think that, I don't know if there's anybody really in Trenton who's interested in restoring it back at where it was before the TTF deal. But, um, but yeah, certainly there's partisan differences in what's gonna happen next. Can I, sure, but yeah. Yeah, let me speak to this as well. This seems rather loud. And that's not just me. I'm assuming our fellows will take care of it. From an investment. Scott, it sounds like you have God's voice. <laughs> I've always felt that way. <laughs> this matters from an investment perspective in an interesting sort of secondary way. When, when we at Brown Brothers Harriman are managing money for clients, and municipal bonds play an important part of most of our clients' portfolios, one of the levels of analysis that we apply when we look at municipal uh, bonds across the country is population flows, demography. We look at people leaving the state. Taxpayers have feet, and they can use those feet. They can move to Naples, for example. Um, so when we see a state where there's a population outflow, it raises the risk in our mind, particularly of general obligation bonds. So it, it wouldn't necessarily dictate the way we thought about New Jersey municipal bonds, but a restoration of the estate tax, in, in our mind, would probably lead to higher borrowing cost as well, yeah. in an interesting sort of secondary or even tertiary way. So there are a lot of ripple effects of this decision beyond just the taxes that some of our clients might or might not pay. Well, the other thing we have to remember, in New Jersey, we're one of only two states that currently have both the inheritance tax and the estate tax. Mm -hmm. Maryland being the other one, and they're, they're, I know they're looking to raise their exemption, I think up to three million or something like that. Um, and our, our exemption in the estate tax is still one of the, you know, one of the lowest, even at two million. Um, but even if we, when we eliminate, this is one thing my colleagues, uh, you know, we have to uh, keep reminding them, we're one of only six states to have an inheritance tax, right? So, and we're at 16, you know, it goes as high as 16%. And one of the reasons why everybody uh, will ask me, why did you go after the estate tax first? And I, and I, I tell them it's because we had to concentrate on keeping businesses here. And, and if you're a, and when we talk about people going to Florida and stuff, as I said last year, I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but if people aren't going away just for the good weather. Where they're going is Pennsylvania if they're owning a business, because New, New Jersey would always tax resident estates not non-resident states. So the quickest way that you would, that you would um, save business costs is you would move to Pennsylvania. 
for your domicile, so we lose all their, all, all their income. Um, but I think that's important to remember. And as uh, in, for businesses, you can transfer you know, uh, a business to a, a mother, a, you know, a son, a daughter in the inheritance side, but not on the estate side. The tax, Mike. I was going to say the tax change that seems most likely to happen most quickly if there's a Democratic governor elected. The sales tax. Uh, with, with the millionaires oh, tax. Oh, the millionaires. Um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, Phil Murphy has, has discussed that in the past, but just yesterday when uh, an agreement about it, an agreement among Democrats about how to uh, proceed with school funding was announced, one of the things that Senate President Sweeney said in announcing that was that on the first day of the new governor's term that they're going to pass a millionaire's tax increase. The amount that he was saying would be raised by that leads me to believe that they're talking about like a, a pure millionaire's tax increase that would start at a million dollars. Sometimes millionaire's tax starts lower than that with the logic that if you're making $400,000, yeah, you're probably a millionaire. But um, you know, they, the state is short of money. And so all these ideas, millionaire's tax, estate tax, different things, you know, for, for a state short of money, there are going to be options that are certainly going to be looked at. But millionaires have feet too. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and there are causes and effects, and I'm reminded again of a, of a question, and it was not a rhetorical question that Abraham Lincoln asked, I think it was in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. He asked his opponent, uh, his sparring partner, uh, if you're, there are five crows sitting on a fence and you shoot and kill one of them, how many are left? And the answer, of course, is none. The other four fly away. <laughs> so if, you know, the, the secondary and tertiary effects of this are something that I hope the State House is taking into account as well. Yeah. The, uh, the one thing, and Michael brings up a very good point, the one thing that the legislature, you know, Trenton looks at is always, how is the Treasury doing? That's a byproduct of how our economy is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we uh, if the one thing, if, after I leave the legislature, the one thing that we focus on and I get the, them to think about is measuring our gross domestic product. We are, and, and when um, they raised the uh, quote unquote millionaire's tax, which I think the last time it started at 400,000 or something like that. Um, well, I think it was back in like 2001 or something, but in, you, you look at the period when they, we went through the recession early in the 2000s. Our response in New Jersey to that first recession was to raise rates mm -hmm. and fees. And, and what that did and from an economic standpoint, you got that price elasticity of demand it lowered the amount of capital and revenue that we're getting in, in, into New Jersey, and it just made us you know, a lot worse. So if you look at our GDP, and New Jersey should, we should be better than the average in the United States. Our assets are better. We're gonna be between Philadelphia and New York. We've got a great location. We have the busiest port on the, on, in North America on the East Coast, the third busiest in North America. Uh, we have a great infrastructure if it's properly maintained, but our GDP, was nearly one full percentage point below the national average. If we just make it up to the average, and we should be better than average, our GDP would be 10% higher, and our GDP in New Jersey is about $550 billion a year. That's 50 to $60 billion of additional economic development that then arguably the state treasury would be 10% better. That's $3 billion. That's the kind of revenue that we need to have in order to, and we won't then be short of money. But we're short of money because we're going after, we went after all the, the tax increases and whatnot and thinking that Trenton is the engine of New Jersey, and it's not. Obviously businesses are, you know, and, and employment is the, is the engine of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Scott, I want to go back to a point that you talked about the crows on the fence. Yeah. When we had the first millionaire's tax, I think it was scored at about $1.4 billion opportunity. And that was uh, during, uh, uh, before, the gov before Governor Christie came in. The next time when, uh, I think in the second term, or um, the legislature right. on the Democratic side wanted to do that, it was scored at $600 million. So obviously the crows are flying mm -hmm. off the fence and flying away after you shoot one mm -hmm. and that. Um, Senator, how do, we, how, do we, how do we prevent something like that? I mean, you, you know, these things sound great when they're put on the table that it's going to raise, but the unintended consequences that Absolutely. our members are always fearful of um, about that. How do, we, how do we get 
the legislature to focus on the unintended consequences. Here's the one thing, I, I, and I'm, uh, I'll give you my political answer and I'll give you the real answer, right? No. The political answer is, quite frankly, it's, it's hard to explain. It's easy to say to people, I'm going to raise the millionaire's tax. And, and from a political standpoint, you know, particularly, you know, obviously on, on, the, on the Democrat side, people love to hear that. They don't understand the unintended consequences of, of that. Um, so, and unfortunately, a lot of things, as, you know, they're thought of in political terms as opposed to financial terms. And it's all, and, you know, long-term planning, as I've said many times, in, in not just Trenton, but I'm sure in, in almost all state houses and, and, and down in Washington, long-range planning is done on a watch as opposed to thinking about, you know, what is the impact you know, three, five, ten years, you know, from now, and that's that's the way we should be looking. Uh, we should be looking at it. Okay, we've been talking about shortfalls, and um, here recently estimates coming out of the Office of Legislative Services and the State Treasurer um, Scudder indicate that there's a budget shortfall of somewhere of five hundred million dollars through fiscal 2018. Um, Scott, let me pose the question to you. How do we make that up? We're well, not going to make it up quickly. I mean, this, this gets back to the laws of unintended consequences. You can sort of raise taxes and plug that hole, but there's a longer term price tag to be paid for that. Uh, you make that up over time with economic activity. And I think a big part of that is keeping people in, in the state. And we haven't really touched on this yet, but I do a lot of work on, on um, demographics and population flows, keeping young people in the state. One of the great resources, I think, of New Jersey is a fabulous higher education system. And uh, that's a good start because people who graduate from college tend to gravitate back towards those colleges. And if you can create an incentive structure for them to stay, create businesses, create jobs, create economic activity, that, that's how you solve that deficit problem in a long term using a calendar as opposed to the watch that Steve referred to. But one of the big issues uh, on the educational side is the fact that New Jersey is one of the largest exporters of, of college talent. Mm -hmm. I think about 31,000 students per year, seniors, migrate out to other universities outside. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, I, it's, a good, that's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a combination of the job opportunities, the career opportunities, particularly for young entrepreneurial talent here. You, you study, and, and, and I'm sure these studies are done at the State House, but you study how it is that other urban areas, San Francisco is probably the obvious example, the Bay Area, uh, are, are able to attract and retain so many young people, so many young entrepreneurs that create so much economic activity, jobs and wealth, and that has a multiplier effect that multiplies throughout the state. I, I think New Jersey needs to work on something like that as well, create some of those clusters. Michael, what are you hearing from people who call into 101.5 about this issue? Well, on the part with, with higher education, for a while it was actually a capacity issue that um, f although we, we have a number of public colleges and universities in the state, compared to other places, it, it's not a very large investment. We spend a whole lot of money on K-12 and then it kind of tails off a lot once you get to, to higher education. So yeah, if you're looking for ways to both boost the economy and keep that generation in the state, keep them from going somewhere else for college. On the budget uh, shortfall, there, there's a whole list of things that they're planning to do to make up for it. One which is kind of a sleight of hand sort of thing is that the state has the, uh, the homestead credits, the, home, the homestead benefits that it pays out, which are now a direct credit on your property taxes. It used to be a check that arrived right before election day, surprisingly. <laughs> but now, now, now they credit it on your May property taxes. Um, so we all, the, 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 those of us who qualify, got that credit in May. The towns aren't getting their money until July because the state is going to defer that payment to the next budget as a way to kind of make it look like this year's budget is balanced better. So that, that gets them more than halfway through the short-term problem. Um, part of how they plan to address it in the coming year is that they're counting on a, an additional roughly $200 million from, uh, I forget the exact phrase, but basically um, in, increased enforcement and collections by the Division of Taxation. Um, they have a whole bunch of different initiatives, including additional auditors um, trying to do a better job of getting tax built out and paid attention to so they're not ignored up front. They haven't really specified everything, but there's, uh, there, there's the expectation 
that it's going to be a $200 million in additional revenue for the budget that will be approved in a couple of weeks. And, you know, if they, in the end, need it to add up to $250 million, I wouldn't be surprised if they just kind of put a different number in the budget. But uh, that, that, that's some of in the near term how they, they hope to deal with that. That's not the long-term structural issues about why we're in the soup we're in. Yeah. Michael, you, opened, uh, you brought one of the big elephants in the room when you talked about property taxes. And I, I know it's one of our questions that's come up about what can be done on property taxes. It's, it's something that um, the lieutenant governor spoke about with uh, a proposal. And um, not sure we had uh, an ambassador Murphy, and he really didn't talk about ta uh, you know, property taxes. You kind of said everything's on the table. But what can be done uh, with property taxes? That's the big elephant, uh, at least the elephant of the day. So what, what do you say uh, as something, some of the items that can be done? And then I'll go to Senator Orr home. We'll come back to you, Scott. If a candidate for statewide office had the answer to that question, they would win in a landslide <laughs> because it is perennially everybody's top concern. And uh, as was said yesterday by someone at the State House, you don't need a poll to tell you that either. Okay. So um, I mean, that, that's part of the motivation for what they're talking about with school aid right now. I mean, school taxes statewide account for 54% of the property tax bill. And that's the statewide average. Um, there's plenty of places where it's 60% of your tax bill, close to 70% of your tax bill. So. Um, Unless this, all told, statewide, the property tax bill is close to $28.5 billion. And as I just said, more than half of that comes from school taxes. So um, the solution would have to find a way to shift that, to, to, to shift some of that cost to some other source of money, um, whether it's a statewide um, revenue source, whatever the case is. Stuff has been done recently to try to limit the growth in spending. The 2% property tax cap has done, I think, a lot on that end. But there's still pressures that uh, are unavoidable with health benefit costs, um, with pension payments that are going to continue to grow for the next few years. And the state's trying to catch up on that. But uh, yeah, if there was. If there was an answer that was easy, then somebody would have gotten elected and reelected on it by now. Senator, what's the conversation amongst your colleagues in, in the State House? Everybody moves in with their parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, honestly, the, the first thing, Ralph, is, is that there ha um, the legislature and the administration have to be honest with you know, the local elected officials, the county officials, and whatnot. And the Transportation Trust Fund is just one example of how this happened. Where that was going, and when I got first asked to take a look at the gas tax, my first reaction is I said to him, you think I'm raising the gas tax in my district? Not happening, right? Just, just put the money back where it belongs. I served on the Unemployment Insurance Task Force, and we came up with um, uh, ideas, and I worked with Commissioner Wurst, who's a colleague of mine, and we served on a freeholder board together, and also with Senator Chisano, and the whole board, Simon Egan, Senator Madden, and the whole board, and we came up with ideas that <clears throat> helped, um, you know, make the unemployment uh, fund, you know, solvent, very solvent again. And in fact, the governor was able to give a, about a, 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 you know, a, a rate decrease, right? That was ha what was happening with the Transportation Trust Fund was the state was jipping the counties and municipalities of what their fair share of that program should have been. In just one example, just one, to the tune of $1.6 billion since, 19, since 1990. And it was billions and billions and billions of dollars. So when I did the financial analysis, and I looked at here with the future, and the future was this. $500 million was going from the general fund into the Transportation Trust Fund, a separate legal entity. It was ready to, it was going to ex explode to $2.3 billion. And how they were covering that was they were really jipping the counties and municipalities, raising, and, and they were raising property taxes. I was actually told by some of my colleagues, people don't realize it, don't do it. You're going to hurt your political career. I said, I, I didn't come down here for a career. I came down to fix problems. So then that's how we really started digging into how it happened. But that's the first thing we have to, to be, is because um, 
sometimes you make the whole budgeting process, and I've been lucky enough to serve on the, the local level, the county level, and then now the state level. Um, it, it gets so, so many complicated sometimes so that you, you know, can't follow. And the whole thing that I had found was that whole debt, spend, and hide. So that is the number one thing. It's, let's just be honest with where, how it really affects. And the, trans, the new transportation trust fund is going to help reduce the pressure on, 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 on property taxes. The number one issue, though, as Michael said, is how do we fund our schools? And we need to have a fair school funding formula that keeps, you know, have our Board of Education held accountable uh, that if there's a drop in enrollment, you manage your budget. Um, uh, probably when Governor Christie first came to office, we were months away from not making payroll. I served on the budget committee, and when the Corson administration had left, they, they had told the Democrat Party and the Republican Party that, oh, there's only a $200 million deficit you know, going in, in January, and we had to fix it by June 30th. Then when Governor Christie took office and the OMB went into him and said, it's not $200 million, it's $2 billion between now and So what the governor had to do is he had to, um, if you recall, take money from capital reserves, maintenance reserves, surplus, from all the school districts just so we could ser conserve cash to make payroll. Well, all my school districts were calling and, and complaining about, uh, calling complaining about why are we losing this, this, this aid or why are they taking this money. So I got three points of data for 10, for 10 years. Enrollment, certified positions, and non-certified positions. And I brought all my school districts into a, a room not as big as this. Um, and, and I pass out the data. And it's all public data. And I said, I'm down there trying to fight for fair school funding, which is based upon enrollment. Every single school district, every single one except for one which was flat, was down. One was down 30%. Move over to certified positions. Every single school district had an increase in certified positions, and every single school district except two had an increase in non-certified positions. So I said, you're all responsible for managing your budget. How am I going to, if your enrollment's going down, how are you not managing that budget? The complaints stopped, completely stopped. And that's one of the big issues is we have to have a school funding formula that holds our school districts, um, and the idea of consolidating school districts. We have accountable for, uh, obviously, changes in, in, in enrollment. And right now, we do, we do not have that. The, the existing formula that I would have never voted for, I wasn't in the legislature at the, at the same time, is easily manipulated, unaccountable, and highly, highly complex to the tune of you just can't. I, I mean, I, I dissect it. I understand it. The, the, uh, I would say the average legislator has no idea how it works. So that being said, should we just throw out the current school funding plan and start from scratch? That would be my idea, because, and I'd keep it nice and simple based upon, you're going to have to deal with uh, uh, special education. You, there's going to be, right. and actually the Republicans, we put out a thing that, to take a look at. You also have to deal with, um, there's, it's going to have, should be based upon you know, student population. Right, um, I think that is. I think everybody agrees that there's a fair basis for that. Special education is going to have to be separately um, uh, uh, dealt with, and then also the idea of like right now they have that free and reduced lunch program, and you get extra aid for that. Now the free and reduced lunch program is a federal program, mm -hmm. um, but what New Jersey bases its extra aid on at-risk students is about five thousand dollars extra per student. And we had an example in Elizabeth where they were fraudulently signing people up for it because under, under federal guidelines, you cannot audit. Now, we're all auditors. Some of us have been auditors before and whatnot. By federal statute, you can only audit 3% of those applications. Even if you find 100% fraud in that 3%, you can only audit 3%. Um, th these are the things that has to change. So we need something that's going to be simple, Enrollment, you know, population, you know, based, um, and it's something that uh, easily, easily understood, accountable, and that you can't manipulate. Okay, 
There's another elephant that's come in from the other side of the room, and that's the, uh, the, the pension obligation issue. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, let me go to you, uh, because the pension obligation has such an impact on the state's debt rating and everything. What are your thoughts? You know, I'm sure you're aware of the, the, the bipartisan task force that, that put together. Uh, it seemed that there were some great recommendations in there, and then for whatever reason, things went to a grinding halt. What are the implications if we don't start to solve that issue, the pension obligation issue? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite simple. I'm kind of a simple-minded economist in a lot of ways. If you can't pay your bills, ultimately you default. You don't pay the bills. That's, that's the way it works. I mean, and I think there's a similar line of thinking here as there is in the previous conversation about the state deficit. Solutions fall into one of two categories. You either increase your income or you decrease your outgo. I mean, that, it's that simple. It's true at a household level. It's true at a state level. It's true at the pension level as well. Um, it's not a unique problem to New Jersey, obviously. Well, yeah, I mean, we know New York, Illinois is a, uh, oh, there's a, a long, situation and a long list long of other list, Long list, long list. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. And we're all aware of why. Uh, pension obligations were made in an environment in which there were higher returns available in financial markets. So it was easier, if you will, to make those obligations. It was politically expedient, in many cases, to make those obligations. Uh, people are living longer, they're, they're, they're um, staying healthier longer, so you've got a situation in which the financial returns simply aren't there as they were expected to be. And that's not a statement about this year or next year, that's a, that's a sort of a secular return observation. Uh, and, and lifespans are lengthening. So I, I think the only real answer to that is, and, and the answer gets harder every day, but reducing the outgo, and this is not politically popular, but I'm not running for office, so I can say this, um, you've got to reduce benefits. And, and you can do that in such a way that it's not painful for current recipients of benefits. You can go, and, and it varies from state to state, and I haven't done the analysis on New Jersey to know exactly where that pain point lies, but I've said this to my colleagues at Brown Brothers Harriman, my younger colleagues, you know, if you're 25 or 35 years old and I say to you, I've got bad news, you're not going to be able to get your pension until you're 70 instead of 68, does that ruin your day? Well, at the age of 35, I can't contemplate being 70 years old, so no, that doesn't ruin my day at all. But to say that to someone when they're 65, that ruins their day. So this is a ticking problem that unless we take care of it at a, at a national level and a state level as well, will only get worse before it uh, gets better. Michael, let me come to you um, with that issue as well, but let me uh, tee it up by saying when the primary, as we were up to the primary, we didn't hear a lot from any of the candidates on that issue with the exception of maybe, I think, Jack Cittarelli, mm -hmm. who talked about a proposal of, you know, if the households did an accumulated income of $50,000 that they should contribute. What are you hearing again from your, your listeners in terms of the, this issue of the potential of having a, a, a retroactive impact on mm -hmm. existing pensioners and maybe decre um, you know, decreasing some of their benefits? Mm -hmm. So um, I think the public, by and large, supports making changes to pensions and health benefits. Um, not, not the public worker public, but <laughs> the, the, the broader public. I think that... Um, when a new governor comes in, regardless of who's elected governor, there may be an opportunity to restart those conversations with the, with the unions. I think that the relationship between this governor and the unions is so shot at this point that there's no possible way that they would engage in a conversation like that with Governor Christie. Um, the upcoming budget that'll be adopted in a couple of weeks was the one where, under a state law adopted very early in the governor's term, we were supposed to get up to a 100% contribution again for the first time in forever. And instead, there'll be a 50% contribution because the state ran into some financial problems a few years ago, and the unions didn't like the pension reform law that was passed early in the governor's term, but they sort of you know, reluctantly had to accept it because it was state law, and then it wasn't followed. And so. I think that when a new governor comes in, um, particularly if additional steps are made toward full funding, I think that um, the governor of either party would then want to restart those conversations about what to do for new hires. But um, there's, uh, the relationship had just gotten to the point where they, they weren't going to have that. But even having said that, um, I think the, like the NJEA yesterday's budget hearing wasn't 
dismissive of this idea related to the pensions and, and the lottery and then trying to do mm -hmm. this complicated transaction. So, I mean, they're willing to listen to things even from the current administration if they think it's to their benefit. But um, I think, you know, even a Democratic primary debates, um, not, not the formal debate, but I was in an event where um, Mer um, Johnson and Lesniak and Wisniewski were there. And they all basically acknowledged, like, yeah, to solve the problem, we need additional concessions. So I don't think that that's the exclusive view of one party or the other. I think that just the relationship between employer and employee needs that reset. There's been recent conversation, uh, I think, in the legislature about redirecting lottery funds. Right. If we do that, then the things, what happens to the things that the lottery was previously funding? Senator, can you? Yeah, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll address that about the, the one thing about the, the changes, just real quick, because the one thing that, without a doubt, it's, it's easy to make promises, and Scott mentioned about, you know, from a political standpoint, the one thing, it's easy to make promises, it's hard to make the payments. Mm -hmm. And when you go back to when the promises were made in 2001, when they retroactively increased benefits 9%, right? Um, they weren't putting money into the pension system. And the stock market, they agreed in July, I think it was July, to, for the retroactive increase. And what happened in March of 2001? The tech bubble, boom, you know, went away. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was go the market was going down. They're promising these payments, you know, these benefits. So there was, the reality hadn't, had, there was no reality. The, the report that came out, going to a cash balance plan, because mm -hmm. when you see what most you know, pr uh, public companies have done, they have got, I was at Young and Rubicam when we instituted a cash balance plan. That is a good way to transition mm -hmm. into a defined contribution plan, gives you a lot of good flexibility. I wholeheartedly supported that uh, report. And I think that's something we should, we should do. There are other things we could do because, uh, like for example, um, this, you know, your highest three years of salary. One of the things we could easily do is go to a career average and do it over, you know, obviously do it over time because what happens in now is somebody gets, hey, 20 years in the pension system, we'll get you a good job for three years at 100,000 and that's what your, your, your pension's based upon. If we went to a career average, those, kind of shenanigans would, would, I think would stop, right? Um, with respect to the lottery, and I'm sorry to get, get, into, that, get into that place, but, um, and, here's, and here's the real problem. As I said yesterday in, in, in the committee, it's, it's really a, a very good idea. Uh, the problem is, it's com it is complicated, and there is absolutely no trust whatsoever amongst elected officials that there, it's not a gimmick, or it's not a game, or anything like this. And really, all it is, is you're taking a future a stream of cash flow, present value and back to now, you're dedicating it to, into the pension system, and really for uses of what uh, cash is used for right now. For example, special education, state institutions, that sort of thing. There's more than, a, the, general, the lottery generates about a billion dollars a year, roughly, right? There's more than a billion dollars a year that goes, that goes right now from the general treasury into those kind of, you know, the state, you know, the state institutions and the, uh, the education that is now constitutionally, you know, um, dedicated for. So it's still going to go for the same resources that goes for it now. Um, the issue becomes um, the reason why the unfunded, you know, liability goes down is because you can fair value that stream of cash flow which when you think about it, all you're using is fair value accounting, because when you think about what's, what is the value of your stock assets or your bond assets, when they look at the funded ratio, it's, it's your market value. Mm -hmm. It's your fair market value, <coughs> which, which uh, on any kind of investment, what is that value of that investment? A discounted back stream of cash flow. Um, now, trying to explain that to voters is, or people, and they think you're, you're, you're gaming the system. The real, I think the real benchmark is going to be, what do the rating agencies say? When you talk to S&P and Moody's and whatnot, is it gonna help the credit rating of New Jersey, which would then help bring down some of the costs of borrowing uh, in New Jersey? And I think that is really the, the, the key um, as to whether you know, people start to, uh, this, is, this is really, 
it's, it's really a win-win situation. People just don't trust us that it's really a good idea. How do we put that trust back? T start telling the truth. You know, give them, be, be a straight talker as, as to the way it's... I was told when I you knew was... I'm the... Michael's, Michael's colleague likes to call me Darth Oroho. Uh, you've probably heard him. That's me, right? But the, the, real, the real issue is, and, and when I went through my primary, um, that's what I told people. I said, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I, I never expected to find what I found. Now, being a former auditor, being a CPA, being a certified financial planner, I was treating it not from a political standpoint, from a financial. What would I do if this was, you know, my personal client? And we've all had to have difficult conversations with clients who are having, you know, financial trouble. And when they're spending a lot more than, or, or they're, they're spending in places where they don't want to tell their spouse they're spending in, in, in places, we've always had to have those difficult conversations. Interestingly enough, when we have those difficult conversations and people understand, it, it takes 10 seconds to say, I don't want the gas tax. It took me an hour to explain to groups this size what was really happening. And when they understood it, a lot of times they said, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't get it. Thank you, because it was absolutely going to property taxes. And when you take a look at it, keeping human capital here, um, the net worth that was leaving, um, I'd show them the IRS data of the $21 billion worth of taxable income that is left in 11 years. Not one year more come in and left, and it was accelerating. So we, all we had to do was just, just be half bad, and we make more money. <laughs> Right? So when you showed them that, people say, I didn't, I didn't realize. And then now the education piece goes out. If you're a retiree in New Jersey, when it's fully implemented, 85% of the retirees will not pay New Jersey income tax. 85%. The average benefit across the state of New Jersey, and it's different by county, because obviously each county is a little bit, you know, the wealth index is a little bit different, is $2,000 on a joint return. When people heard that, and particularly like say um, NJA members, some of it, they said, "We never, we didn't know that. We didn't, we didn't, uh, we, we didn't understand that." Um, so, quite frankly, I think the real thing: how do you put it back? You start telling, you're honest with people, and you tell them the truth, irrespective of whether it's going to get you elected or not. Speaking about honesty, one of the conversations that's always been had in New Jersey is about consolidated services, mm -hmm. uh, shared services. Um, why is that not a viable solution? Well, it, it appears to be, a, it should be a viable it solution, but why are people reluctant to go to shared services? Well, I think there are a lot, there is a lot of that done. I mean, I'm sure that more could be, but um, I, I live in a town where our school superintendent is also the school superintendent in one of the neighboring towns. And I think there, there are examples of that. Um, around, there's, uh, there's a reluctance to actually go beyond just sharing services to merging. I mean, yeah. the two Princetons, it took them 15 years of repeatedly rejecting votes to point. do it. And then, and then ultimately they found that there were, there were benefits to it. I think the but it worked though. Yeah, yeah the, so, it I mean, worked and the state came in, I think, with some financial support, which is part of the carrot that you would have to do. But, you know, people don't, uh, you know, People like to live in their little town, and even if it makes sense that you could save money by merging with the little town next to you and sharing a police chief and all the rest of that, people get parochial. I think one of the key things, and my, that's an excellent point, uh, Michael, because one of the th key things about that 2% cap is it does force some of these conversations. You know, in, in the whole issue, and I firmly believe, I firmly believe in one of the things I think would certainly help our, our property taxes, I firmly believe in school choice, um, which I think would help with competition in schools. And I also believe in the consolidation within school districts makes a lot of sense. Shared services amongst municipalities, I think, um, you know, uh, makes a lot of sense. But what happens is if people forget on that 2% cap, a lot of time legislators come in and say, we have to give the municipalities a way to raise more money. And I said, well, wait a minute, why? Well, you know, why are we going to do We have the 2% cap in. There's also a relief valve. If a municipality or county wants to go above the 2%, or, and school board, they want to go above the 
They go to the voters. And one of the problems is, and, and I, when I was on the, the local council, when the, when the budget got voted down, the easiest thing to do was to bring in the school board and say, okay, what are we going to get rid of? Or what, what are we going to cut? Um, or how do we have to you know, um, have more discipline within the budget? Because I knew there was fluff in there. And they said, well, well Steve, we don't have to, you don't have to cut anything. I said, no, the, the voters rejected it. So, and quite frankly, it was very easy. Um, I said, we can go through this list of six pages of questions I have, or you can come back and tell me how much you can reasonably take out of the budget. And the president of the school board said, ah, Steve, we don't have to do this way. One of the members goes, hey, wait a minute, let's go out and talk. They went out a the hallway, they came back and said, Steve, how about, it was about 250,000. I said, that's reasonable. Boom, done, you know? But there is a relief valve that they can go to the voters. There's such a, but you know what? When they go to the voters, they have to explain why. And they're, and they're afraid of that. And I think the 2% cap is, is good for that. And I do think it's helped enforce some of those conversations of shared services. To, the, to this issue, just, this is just occurring to me, but to this issue of transparency in government and also honesty with the numbers, I wonder if there's not also an issue of of financial literacy. So, so if, if voters had a better concept of issues that are bread and butter to us, net present value, and the fact that you know you want to solve a deficit, it's increasing income or decreasing outgo, I mean, that might add to the transparency as well. I wonder if NJCPA has maybe a role to play in, I mean, there are a lot of people have a role to play in financial literacy, but educating, informing the voters as to what the multiple implications are of, of the decisions that they face. Well, actually, one of the things we actually did, and Senator, it was actually Senator Sweeney's uh, bill, and, and uh, Steve has, has done I have a good relationship with Senator Sweeney, does an, an excellent job, was financial literacy in, in schools, in, mm -hmm. the, in the high, you know, starting the, with the high schools and, and, and whatnot. But I think that is something that, let's face it, one, one of the things that we all as CPAs, you know, people, we were more, one of the most trusted professions, in, you know, uh, on earth is because, you know, Unfortunately, people are not comfortable with with the you know with, with finances mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. But I, I do think having a lot of that financial literacy is is mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. Well, Scott, thanks for bringing that issue up because it's a great opportunity to put a commercial out here for our members. <laughs> <that> I was <laughs> not paid uh, to no, do that. No, no, no. I know we'll we'll take care of you later. Uh, but one of the things that the the society has tried to do is have a seat at the table. Yep. And uh, because our members touch every taxpayer constituency, every business out in the community. But in, in the past, we, we really haven't been brought to the table until her recently on the estate tax, and I, I think we've had an impact. You guys we did like, a great job. Thank you. You really did. Thank you. I think that's what we want to do more of that and have, how do we get the legislature to reach out to our members to get a pulse read on what the pros, cons of various public policy that they're reaching. Um, I know we try to do it with our you know, advocacy effort, but how do we get your colleagues in Trenton to say, hmm, maybe we should go talk to the NJCPA? I, I know you do. I, you, I think personally, I, <laughs> right, I think personally, I think the best, and. Uh, Rob, I could, everybody in this room can be one of the most impactful uh, people in the state in the next couple of years, you know, over the next couple of years, because of the issue of we will see the impact of the tax changes be before Treasury sees it, all right? And there'll be attempts to repeal things and whatnot. And if we can help educate this, you know, this whole issue of capital flight and, and, and whatnot. But I think the best thing, you have gotten more aggressive at, at, at contacting uh, local, you know, your legislators uh, to sit down and meet with them. Uh, and I think that is very important. And I think once you continue to build that, you know, build that trust where um, I get calls into my office all the time for meetings and whatnot, whether it be in the office or in Trenton, or I think it's, it's uh, critical that you continue to have the kind of presence that you had or have, uh, particularly over the past cu a couple of years, and th then they will start to gravitate towards, because even here, like uh, Senate President Sweeney talk often 
about, I had a conversation with Ralph, you know, I had, and Paul Sarlo, who's, who, who's, who's a, uh, an engineer by, you know, by trade, um, and obviously you know, people on my side of the aisle with uh, Tom Kane and whatnot, but you're now hearing about um, I, heard, I had a, uh, a conversation with the New Jersey CPAs and whatnot. Your survey you did about uh, the impact of the estate tax and advice being given by CPAs to their clients got noticed. It got noticed. So uh, where I think it was, what, 75% had told their clients, Advise their leave, clients to leave. go. Yes, as part of their and strategy. And because of the changes in the estate tax, I think it was right around the 33% had said, no, we, we're, we've changed our advice. Another third or so is sitting there saying, we want to make sure it goes away completely, then we'll change our advice. And uh, I think uh, the rest, uh, you know, a third basically said, New Jersey's too expensive anyway, keep going. You know, and it shows that we still have a lot more work to do. But that got noticed. And somebody like myself, I see it incumbent upon myself um, to use that kind of uh, information from, from, because let's face it, you have um, a brand. A brand of a CPA is the most trusted advisor. If somebody like myself is able to take that kind of information and bring it to my colleagues, I th and you're also meeting with, with them, I think that's, you know, I'd keep on the same path as you are and keep, keep going. Thanks, thank you. Um, interesting, we, I, it looks like we have Willie Nelson in the house. And uh, he's posed a question, and the question is, with the upcoming administrative change, what is the likelihood of recreational marijuana legislation? What's the impact on the state's economy? Didn't know Willie was a CPA. I, I don't know. It, well, maybe we're reaching out to everybody okay, now. <laughs> thoughts, on, thoughts on that? There's been conversations. We've seen activity in Washington and, and also Colorado, I believe. <laughs> Uh, it poses an interesting situation because marijuana, while uh, on a federal level, is still an illegal drug, right. so it, it, it poses some interesting challenges like people can't deposit money in, in banks. Uh, they pay for taxes or, or, or whatever fees in cash where they bring bags of money. What's been the conversation in, in the State House uh, around the legalization of uh, re recreational marijuana? Uh, f personally, I'm, a, I'm against it. Um, and I think some of the, you know, I, I always say my, my, my middle son who's an engineer, he did move out to Denver, Colorado. He did not go for the marijuana. You know, he, um, he went for an another good job. But I think what you're starting, what you see, and it depends who you talk to. Obviously, if you talk to Senator Scutari, a good guy, he, Nick's all behind it. He wants it, thinks we'll make you know, a lot of money and whatnot. Now the governor, I agree with the governor's stance that I don't want to be making money on something that on, on social costs could end up costing us a heck of a lot more money down the road. And I think that's you know, some of the things that some of the states, now obviously I'm going to read the, I'm, going to, I'm biased, I'm going to read the, the information that I think helps you know, sometimes my, you know, my point, but I think some of the... Um, Evidence coming out from some of the states I have with respect to Oregon and Colorado and whatnot is that their, their social costs are, are going up, you know, uh, be, you know, because of it. I also worry about, I'm, I have, you know, five, five children. Oldest is 35, youngest is 25 now, and uh, five and five grandchildren. I, I, I do worry about it. And when I went to, uh, listen, we were all in college. Uh, I will tell you, did I drink a lot of, you know, a lot of beer? Yeah, I did. But I also saw a number of my personal friends who, and the marijuana today is simply, you know, uh, stronger. But I, 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 my personal experience was I saw the, some who went from 4 row students to not even wanting to go to class because some of the apathy and, 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 and whatnot. Now, that was only because of my personal experience. So, but I am not, um, I don't think we solve our budget problem, problems this way. I think there's uh, the law of unintended consequences, certainly, and I think down the road it, it'll cost us more money than, than we actually make. So I, I, I don't think it should be even a, a it sh could it be a social policy discussion? Sure. Should it be a budget discussion? No. Michael, have, uh, have your listeners been weighing in on this issue uh, about 
our recreational marijuana? The, the evening host likes to make it a topic of conversation <laughs> any time he can. Um, so with, with that, without taking a position either way on it, the, uh, the first legislative hearing on the issue is Monday. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee is meeting, and they'll have people in from all around the country testifying on the benefits and demerits of the idea. Um, the current bill that's in would basically uh, start the tax rate on it, I think it's 7%, which is, and then and eventually ramp it up to 25. The idea being that, and, and the, the people who support the idea say it's not being done for budget reasons, but they say that you know, you're probably looking at $300 million a year in annual revenue to the state um, from a state regulated thing where you wouldn't be able to grow any at your own home. You would basically have to buy it only from state licensed and state supervised uh, retail facilities, but between the growing and all the rest of it, they say that there's a uh, financial benefit to it and that they intend to pass it probably by this time next year, depending on who gets elected governor. Um, Phil Murphy, Democratic candidate, has expressed interest in it. Kim Guadano, the Republican candidate, has basically said, given the views of Attorney General Jeff Sessions on it, that it's not even really a conversation worth having, that um, you know, she supports improving the, the medical program that the state has. And I think she also said looking at decriminalization of marijuana possession, but not outright legalization. Can we pause, though, for a minute and just marvel at the wisdom of our founding fathers? and the laboratory of democracy in which we've got test cases of this. So we can look at what's going on in Colorado or Oregon or some of the bills that mm -hmm. have passed in November of last year that have broadened the legalization of it at different levels and at different tax rates. And so many issues that we face, whether it's this or whether it's uh, uh, minimum wage, I mean, you can look around this country and look at these little test cases and learn from them and That's judge true. the applicability mm -hmm. to your state, and every state's different, your community, and I, I just, you know, as much challenges as we face as a nation, I'm, I'm occasionally reminded the wisdom of the, of, of the founders in putting into practice uh, a process, a structure like this in which we can learn from experiments elsewhere. And a group of lawmakers from New Jersey went to Colorado yeah. To, yeah. to study the experience there, talk with the industry, talk with police chiefs, that kind of thing. And the unintended consequences, the advantages, the disadvantages. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's a great laboratory. I, mean, I, was, Scott, I think you made up a good point there about looking at what's happening elsewhere, and mm -hmm. you mentioned minimum wage. And, uh, sorry, that's sorry about that. Yeah. I, I, well, I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough topic, yeah. but um, recently, you know, we, the legislature has been talking about it. Um, I've been talking about it a lot, uh, but I think the, the unintended consequences behind those haven't been addressed. Um, we looked at a study out from Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. where they had increased Great test case. Uh, minimum wage, and the year after it happened, unemployment rose. Mm -hmm. You had individuals saying, I don't want to work 40 hours, I want to work less because I get subsidies and I go over that threshold, I don't get my subsidies. So why is it that we don't do more of that or bring in, or bring in outside consultants to help look at proposals? In, in the legislation. Senator, I'll, 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 I'll toss yeah. that ball to you. Yeah. Actually, uh, in some, um, I will tell you, one of the, and uh, actually a little bit on, on the medical marijuana side, is as a legislator, um, a lot of legislators like to think that there's the smartest people in the room. We're not. And we need to be educated on each one of these kind of, you know, the kind of topics. There's, a, there's an expert in each field that we can, and it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we reach out to them. And that, a lot of times, it's like, uh, quote unquote, lobbyists will get a, a bad reputation. But when you, when they, um, and you get the uh, viewpoint from both sides uh, of, of an issue, is important for a legislator, you know, to do. I actually changed my opinion on the medical marijuana side because I learned about the edible forms and how it helped you know, children uh, with Darve syndrome and stuff like that, right? But on any issue, you know, you know bringing in to see, okay, um, the experts in, in those fields, and that's why sometimes the idea of having a commission or a study or something like this is really could be a good thing 
It could also be something that just says, okay, I don't want to deal with it. Let's make a, a study task force stuff. But sometimes the task force, is, you know, where we can have the kind of people come in and, and who are experts in the field is, criti is to me, is critically important. Yeah, uh, we had another question coming in about the, the uh, unintended consequences of uh, having mar legalized marijuana and the fact that, you know, federally chartered banks can't accept money. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Our members probably may be a little bit challenged in terms of doing work because if you're affiliated with that, you could uh, uh, suffer some unintended consequences as a result of that. So, but it also could present an opportunity too for our members in terms of a new uh, new opportunity. So, we could have all had a better time last night too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I think they had a good time last night. I think they did. <laughs> I think I, like I said, I would. Very happy to see everyone out this morning and everything uh, uh, from the good time. Um, let's go to uh, a, another issue that has uh, always uh, been on the, on, the, on the top of the heap, and that's do we have too much government here in New Jersey? Is there an opportunity? We've reduced some costs, but is there more that can be done in terms of reducing costs, also achieving efficiencies, if you will, there seems uh, there have been just conversations about redundancies and various departments um, <laughs> being more efficient in the permitting process so that businesses, um, I'll, I'll toss that to uh, Michael because I'm sure you've probably gotten a lot of calls from listeners about government just doesn't work here. Right, so um, at the state level, Governor Christie says all the time that the number of employees now at the state level is whatever, 10,000 less than it was when he got here, 11,000 less. Those reductions actually began even before he got here. The, the state employment peaked in 2006, and it decreased for each of the four years that John Corzine was governor, and then continued to decrease over the last few years. So, whereas it was once over... 80,000, I think, public employees, 82,000 almost. I think we're at around 68,000 at this point, which includes all the employees who work at state colleges and, and universities. Right. Um, so that's not just like the people who are, uh, I'm pretty sure that's yep, the people true. who are directly yep. in trend. You're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, so there's, there's state level government, there's, and then there's obviously county, local, and school. The biggest issue, I think, for the state government operating more efficiently is that the computers and the IT system Ugh. is atrocious. And, it, and part of why it is is the same reason why the state house itself got into the position it is. It's the easiest thing to defer. And money's tight, we're not going to improve the computers. Money's tight, we're not going to do this with the state house. And so the physical condition that you see in Trenton, which is now causing them to basically shut the executive wing of the state house down for four years to do renovations, the computer system is just kind of as bad off. And the, Governor Christie, in, in recent months, even the Office of Information Technology has basically been given some new authority to try to, to, to improve that. But it's, it's going to cost money, and uh, it's, so that's the hard part of doing it. But any efficiencies need to start there. I, I, I agree. The, the, the status of the, of the technology, we're 25 years behind business, not only in technology standpoint, because we still have COBOL systems, right? Um, we're 25 years behind you know, industry in, in technology. We're 25 years behind industry in business processes. Um, so all we really had to, I was uh, glad to be a, an original member of the Red Tape Review Committee. Um, I'm glad to have served on it every year since. It was actually Senator Sweeney and I who put in a, had a bill that would, um, that would um, create something of what the, President Ronald Reagan had done with the Grace Commission. And that was the impetus for the, for the red tape review. I just signed on for a bill uh, yesterday to make it permanent because it's something we have to keep a focus on. Um, and the idea of making our current systems or current processes more efficient, uh, taking time out of the process and having our uh, different departments focus on, on um, you know, uh, process improvement and, and taking 
you know, uh, time or steps out and stuff. So that's something I think the red tape review can continue to do. Uh, but also a big part is to stop some of the regulations that will keep on coming, you know, you know, through uh, through through the front door. Um, but I, I absolutely think that um, as we become more technologically, you know, better, and we should be investing in the, in that. Uh, I, I think government, uh, there, there's a lot of things we can do to become more efficient. I was reading also today, if you take a look at our, not necessarily in New, not in New Jersey, but in, from a, a government standpoint, look at our status of the energy industry today, right? Back when I got out of college and stuff, um, we would never think we could be energy independent, right? Not because of government, but because of technology, we're now an exporter of energy, and we're one of the, uh, obviously, I think, the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas. And we would have never thought that. Now, what, you know, how did we get there? It wasn't because of government we got there. It was because of the private industry and the technology that we got there. To me, that's a great lesson where we completely, you know, changed where we thought we were going to be 30 years ago to where we are today with respect to mm -hmm. energy. It had nothing to do with government. It had all to do with private industry. One of our questions that came in is, uh, what can be done to bring millennials back to New Jersey or keep them from leaving the state? I, I think that was some of the, the college issue as well. Right. I think one of the things we have to focus on in New Jersey is branding, right? We have a great location. We, we have a great, we have, you know, a, four season resort type things here. We have so many assets. We do a horrible job. First of all, we outprice them. And that's what we did with our taxes and fees. And then we do a horrible job of what the brand of New Jersey is. The brand of New Jersey is what turnpike, what, what exit, you know? Um, and unfortunately, that's what we have to, you know, uh, I was fortunate to work in a company called Young and Rubicam and some of the greatest uh, creative minds in the world from all different kinds of, you know, come, and we did a thing called the brand asset valuator and whatnot. And that's the thing that I think New Jersey has to also focus on, bringing down our costs, right, our, our taxes and our fees, but also what is our brand? And I think one of the brands I'd like to, you know, take a look at is, you know, come to New Jersey, you know, and we, we could be the um, incubating state, the growth, you know, kind of state. And when we, when we do something like that, um, like, hey, we are the Garden State, maybe we could come to the Garden State and grow, and grow our economy. That's the kind of you know, things that we have to be able to sell. If you look at, we're number one in a lot of positions, on in some industries, you know, our agriculture, a lot of, you know, some of our, obviously the shoreline is, is terrific. We do a horrible job of branding that. But that's the good news. Because that, not that that's easy, but that's, there's so many natural resources here to right. begin with that, that branding it appropriately, cleverly, compellingly is, is, is the easier thing to do. You read these studies, and we're all still trying to figure out the millennial generation. Goodness knows I am. But the studies you read about what it is that, that, that attracts and retains millennials and keeps them to start a family, build a business, build a career, whatever it is, it, it, is it comes down to a small handful of things. And, and, and this is true across geographies, which is interesting. Um, it's urban living versus rural living or suburban living. I think New Jersey scores high on that. It's ready access to culture, broadly defined, so everything from you know, opera to football, sort of everything combined. New Jersey has great access to that. And it's ready access to transportation. Yeah. I mean, just sort of when, 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 I mean, you know, stop me. But the story is really good. I mean, it's, it's all there. I think, yes, it's a, it's a branding issue. It's, it's some of the cost issue as well, whether it's some of the things we've talked about, property taxes, the cost of living. Um, but I, I would take encouragement from that because those are addressable challenges. And I think the opportunities far outnumber the challenges. And New Jersey tries, has been trying to do more to promote, um, I guess, transportation options that don't rely on cars, which right. a, lot, a lot of people don't want cars now. And so you see a lot, of in, uh, a, a lot of places where there's a lot of demand are places in Union County that are close mm -hmm. to the rail lines that take you into New York, or people are in Hoboken and Jersey City. Mm -hmm. You know, we were having this conversation the other day. The governor was announcing a, a new park that they're going to build a waterfront park in Trenton along the Delaware River. 
and a, a pedestrian walkway bridge that's going to take you from the park that's kind of above the State House uh, deck over Route 29, because basically Trenton has like four miles along Route 29 where the city is completely disconnected from what would be its greatest natural resource, okay. being, being the river. And people were saying afterwards, like, you know, how is this going to help Trenton? You know, Trenton has all these issues and all these problems. But if you were to go back 25 to 30 years and say to people, oh, this is what's going to happen in Jersey City, mm -hmm. people wouldn't have believed that. Or 10 years further back than that, what become of Hoboken, people wouldn't have believed that. So you know, there, I think there's a lot of pessimism from years of observation about efforts to help in Camden and now these new efforts to help in Trenton. But it, you know, it, it, it's possible to change perspectives. Mm -hmm. And so it's That's a really good analogy. When I graduated from a New Jersey college and went to work in New York many years ago, I lived in Jersey City because I had to. And I marvel at the fact now that my younger colleagues live in New Jer Jersey City and Hoboken because they want to. I mean, that, that's, it's in 25 years, a generation or a little less, it's completely changed. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. You, you, when the recessions come, right, I, I think back over history, I think a lot of times there is a natural, um, in a recession or a you know, downturn, people will then consolidate back into the, into, into the cities. You know, our, you know, our younger generations, you know, deferred buying a house, deferred having children. And then as the, I'm just wondering, do you think as we become more comfortable that, okay, I'm going to have a good job, I'm gonna, I, now I want to start a family, will, will it still concentrate, you think, in, in the urban centers? Or will it start to then go back out to, you know, I want the yard, I want the... It's a good question. I think there's both a cyclical trend, which you've referred to, that, that depends on the economic right. cycle, but there's also a secular trend right. as, as well. And, and like everything else we've talked about this morning, that secular trend back into the cities has its advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, a generation ago, I'm going to generalize, but I think it's probably pretty fair, a generation, two generations ago, you graduated from college, you moved to New York City because that's where the job was and it was exciting and there were bars and it was, you could meet a spouse and then you met that spouse and then you got married and then you had a kid and, and you left. <laughs> and, and, and about a generation ago, and you, we can debate all day why this happened, but New York became a better place to live, safer place to live, and you thought, let's just stay, let's raise a family here. Well, all of a sudden there weren't enough schools, there wasn't enough real estate, I mean, this is sort of the unintended consequences of it. But, but my, my read of the millennials is that they are less interested in the acquisition of assets I agree. that we all grew up with. I mean, we all grew up with the path to financial stability is as soon as you can afford to do so, put a down payment on a house because that's how you build wealth over the long term. The millennials learned a very different lesson in, in, in 07, 08, 09. Houses weren't sales, they were anchors. And, and, and by the way, they were also anchors to job mobility as well. So I, I don't have any proof of this yet because we haven't seen it, but I think what we're seeing is a sustainable desire to return to more urban living because you don't have to own assets like cars, yeah. for example. Uh, that's probably sustainable. Household formation, the kind of things that, that have always taken place generation to generation, I think is just deferred. Mm -hmm. I, I think this generation will end up owning real estate and, and, and looking, their balance sheets will look like the kind of balance sheets we're accustomed to looking at. They'll just look like that more at the age of 38 than instead of the age of 28, or something like that. Let's shift the conversation a little bit to Washington, D.C., and what's happening down there. What's happening down there? What do you uh, mean? Well, <laughs> we just did Hill visits down in Washington and as a result of our, at our um, AICPA council meeting. Mm -hmm. We were able to go up and meet with uh, the staff and, and, and a number of members of, uh, of the New Jersey delegation. And uh, one of the questions that's, that's popped up is, you know, the proposals that are on the table for, from, for tax reform. And the Republican proposals include a, a, an elimination of property taxes um, in the scheme. What kind of impact do you think that'll have on New Jersey, the New Jersey housing market, in terms of uh, people staying in New Jersey. You mean the deductibility? Deductibility, yeah, yeah, yes, okay. of, okay. of, of uh, state tax. Of state taxes, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's honestly hard for me to see that passing at the national level as part of tax reform because it is such an important part of the, the, the mental calculus, not only state of 
uh, of New Jersey and New York, but, but you know, a lot of other states as well. So I think that the state reaction, the state's opposition to that will end up carrying the day. Now I'm keenly aware of the fact that the administration in Washington is Republican and this is an issue that faces mostly Democratic states. <laughs> so I'm aware of that political uh, uh, calculus as well. Um, but it, it, I mean, it would accelerate some of the trends that we've been talking about of uh, taxpayer flight to states in which that's not an issue. Especially since New Jersey, the average property tax is like eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and the national average is like thirty nine hundred, thirty eight hundred. Mm -hmm. um, I could have a, a real devastating impact. Crows, if that would... crows fly away. <laughs> yeah. I think the crows will fly away. That may be our new branding for you know crows, <laughs> crows fly, fly away, away <laughs> in terms of that. Um, one of the other conversations about, I, I'm sorry, Mike, any, any thoughts on? Yeah, the, the only uh, thing I would say is, uh, and hopefully I, I agree with Scott that uh, they would gravitate where it would not occur, but it'd be interesting to see what would be the reaction in New Jersey if that happened. Would that force more consolidations quicker? You know, because a lot of times, you know, um, obviously we, we react to things that happen down there. So, you know, is, would, would that be something that would actually push us along to doing things that we should have done a long time ago? Unintended consequences don't have to be bad. Don't have to be bad. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the, the whole conversation around the Affordable Care Act, um, I remember at, I believe it was in an NJBIA meeting down in East Windsor where um, uh, Paul Sarlo, chair of the, uh, the budget committee, talked about that being one of the big concerns that if there was a repeal of ACA, the impact that right. could happen to New Jersey. If I remember correctly, that potential impact was somewhere in the neighborhood of between 300 to 400 million dollars. Right, yeah. hmm. What happens if ACA gets modified, repealed? How does New Jersey deal with that? Because currently there's nothing in the budget proposal to address, you know, potential rollback uh, of, of benefits that could come back to states. Yeah. Um, and because of the expansion that New Jersey had in its, in its Medicaid, you know, uh, program, um, if there, it, it would have an impact on the budget. Now, depending upon what they actually do down in, in Washington, uh, once again, I think it, it could create things that New Jersey should be doing. Like, for example, New Jersey should be having an aggressive health care spending, you know, um, uh, account, um, similar to like a, I call it a health care 401k, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, and we don't, and we don't do that, you know, we don't do that now. I think some of the things of, obviously, I, I do believe in better competition would certainly help. I do believe, and even though I'm an, uh, an insurance producer, I don't sell health insurance, but I do have my producer's license. I do believe in cross, you know, state, you know, um, I do believe in bringing people back into the marketplace. I, I personally think one of the biggest issues in healthcare, not to just relate to New Jersey, is that, you know, most people have no idea what the real cost of healthcare is from the providers, you know, right through the, you know, through the third party administrator, the insurance companies and whatnot, and the patient or the customer who thinks, okay, what's the cost of healthcare? They say, oh, my deductible is this and my copay is this. And they're completely, you know, devoid of, you know, you know what the real you know, cost has to, happens to be. I think we really have to bring the consumer back into the equation so they can understand. I think some of the things that we're doing now and talking about this whole transparency bill with respect to added ad network charges, surprise charges, and, and, and whatnot. Um, we talked before about bringing experts in. I've had a lot of discussions with you know, doctors, anesthesiologists, um, dentists, the whole bit, uh, educating me about you know, what they go through. Forget about providing medical care. They become office managers more than any, anything else. That's what we got to get. We we have to get back down to how do how do we um, make uh, uh, healthcare understandable, you know, affordable, and it's interesting. Was it, um, I, Cleveland Clinic? I was just seeing today. Cleveland Clinic is thinking about getting into 
the insurance business with respect to having like a concierge type of type of service. service. Uh, so I, I just heard it when I was coming. There was on CNBC where Scott, you're on often. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I thought that was that was you know pretty interesting. Uh, but I, an interesting thing on that the price the price tag associated with that. I heard I, I here at the conference from people were throwing twenty five hundred dollars for that concierge, yeah. three thousand like dollars almost. Yeah. yeah. But I think just the whole issue, would it have an impact on New Jersey? It would. Who knows what's going to come out of Washington? Okay. Who knows? A sort of a recurring theme in a lot of the budget hearings was that commissioners would come in and say, you know, there might be EPA cuts. What are you doing to prepare for that? And the stock answer always was, well, it's too soon to know what's going to happen. And uh, so hopefully behind the scenes, there's more planning than that going on. And, and, and I just didn't want to say it publicly because the way that the calendar works out is that the state's going to adopt our budget very soon, but the federal haggling over their budget m may get resolved around October, and then we have a new administration coming in three months after that. So uh, I can understand the reluctance to discuss it publicly, per particularly given the alliance between the governor and the president. Mm -hmm. And so I understand why the question wasn't being answered. I just hope that privately <laughs> more is actually being done. Okay. We're winding down on time. Less than five months to November. What happens in November? Who's in control here in New Jersey? Hopefully the voters. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you a politician? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, the Quinnipiac poll that came out this week shows Murphy ahead by better than two to one margin and it shows the president's approval rating under 30% and the governor's approval rating at 15%. So uh, it would be really difficult to envision uh, Lieutenant Governor winning, but you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, people care about property taxes. And so if there's a path forward, it would be for her to hit that message and hit it to a point where people believe it. She said in her election night speech that she wouldn't run for a second term if she didn't lower property taxes in the first term. And the same Quinnipiac poll showed that like two thirds of people don't believe that promise, <laughs> which gets back to the trust issue, which mm -hmm. probably underlies all sorts of problems that are going on. Any dramatic change in the, in the, um, the assembly or the Senate as a result of the November election? Honestly, Rob, I, who, who knows? It really depends upon candidate recruitment and whatnot. And I will tell you, when I first ran for, I never thought I'd be in the Senate. I never thought I'd run for elected office. How I got here was, you know, an interesting route. But um, when I first got in to run for Senate, I was 22 points down, and the and th this is for the primary. And I got in in February, and the primary is in June. And I didn't know I was 22 points down. They didn't want to tell me and, and uh, depress me too much, but I, I ended up winning, and it was a lot of hard work and whatnot. So. No matter what what the polls will say, th you know things can change. Uh, does Lieutenant Governor Guadano have a um, a hill to climb in public opinion? Without a doubt. And but I I, I do think with um, the right kind of I, I I really do believe the candidate that's going to be on it and really talk straight to people and tell them what the real stories are. I think that's what the people really want to hear. Now, unfortunately, it's not a 10-second soundbite. It's a 30-minute conversation, mm -hmm. and that's that, and maybe even more. Um, so, I, and that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge we have. And there's only 24 hours in a day, but I think really, I think anything can happen in November. It's a long thank way you, away. Senator, and thank you, panelists. We've come to our the, our time limit. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. You guys. Are... Thank you all Thanks for job, your time this morning, for your candor, and let's hope that the voters do um, be are in charge of what happens in New Jersey in November. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.